Welcome everyone to this Zoominar related to Sabbath and sabbatical, something most of us are poor at, but we'd like to get better. And we're going to talk all sides of that. Why should we do it? How should we do it? Why is it important in the first place? A number of those kind of things. And to kick things off today, one of our guests is Jim Black out at Stanford University. Jim, would you pray to start things today? Yeah, happy to. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this gathering. Uh, thank you for the gift of the technology that enables us to do this, have this conversation in this way, even though we're really all over the country. We pray that you would direct us, um, and we pray that this would be uh, a beneficial conversation, that you would receive glory for it, and it would translate into joy and good in our lives, and it would help us serve better the people that you've put uh, in front of us. So make use of this, we pray, Lord, bring yourself glory and guide everything we say. We're grateful people in Jesus name. Amen. 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 On the front end here, just by way of introduction, uh, I'll introduce to you our three guests and then have them tell you a little bit more about themselves in a moment. First of those you already heard from is Jim Black of Fellowship of Christian Athletes at Stanford University. Uh, Jim, can you tell us a little bit about your role and how long you've been there? Yeah, I've, uh, I've been in ministry for a long time. I was a senior pastor of a church in Texas for nearly a decade, but for the last 12 years, I've worked with college students, um, first in New York City at Columbia for six years, and then the last six years here at Stanford. I've been on staff. I was with a different ministry. I've been on staff with FCA for the last two years here, leading that uh, effort here at Stanford. Excellent. Sarah Gackle, you're in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, she's serving with FCA at University of Alabama at Birmingham. What can you tell us about your role there and how long you've been serving, Sarah? Yeah, well, a little, little irony for you, Jim. Uh, I also serve at Samford, Sam, not Stan. Yes, that's right. Uh, My bad. So we have a t-shirt. I didn't even know it's going to be on here. We have a t-shirt at our university that says Sam, not Stan. <laughs> that's great. All the time. That's hilarious. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I've been on FCA staff for... 11 years now and have had a college campus, whether it was the United States Air Force Academy, University of Colorado, Colorado Springs, uh, Sanford, and then other colleges in the Birmingham Metro, somewhere in the mix. Um, so yeah, I love it. I love the college athlete, um, really special environment to do ministry and to serve. So yeah, that's where I'm at. Excellent. Mike Litz is down at Southeast Missouri serving with FCA and Cape Girardeau, Missouri. Mike, can you tell us a little bit about your role and how long you've been doing it and maybe how long you have left to do it? Uh, well, actually, it's Jackson, Missouri. Cape and oh. us are rivals, but, but I'll correct you there, Rob. <laughs> we love Cape. Um, so I've been with FCA since 2015. I'll be with FCA for another month and a half uh, as I'm nearing retirement, which is amazing. And um Really looking forward to the next season of my life. But I got hired here to establish FCA in Southeast Missouri. Never had a, uh, a staff member. So I was hired as area director. And as you all probably know, if you work for FCA, that meant I was a campus director at our university, an area rep, an area director, and a football chaplain for the last seven years. So wore a lot of hats. It's been an amazing run, a lot of fun. We've since been able to add staff. I came out of the church world. Prior to that, as a missions pastor, and prior to that, ran my own business for 25 years. So, a uh, long uh, few changes along the way, but all good. Excellent. Well, some of those comments directly dovetail into our discussion today, talking about Sabbath, rest. Most of us are not very good at this. Uh, anybody jump in, if you will. Tell us, why do you think rest is important so much that it is 10% of the Ten Commandments? Why is it so important? Sarah, I know you have thoughts about this. Yeah, I, I would argue it's actually more than 10%. Uh, oh. if you look at the wording, like we really elaborate on what it means to Sabbath. Other things are just a simple oh, one. Good. Um, why? I would say it's modeled by our God, mm -hmm. number one. Two, it's really an act of faith that he is provider and that what I already have is good. Um. Yeah, that, that would be my two-pronged answer as as to why. That second thought there is a really insightful thing, I think. Um, 
because I think our normal bent is to work harder, work right. longer. Right. And it's a matter of faith to think the Lord's providing. It's not on me. Yeah. Especially in ministry. If, if I believe I am the only means by which souls can be saved or lives can be changed, I'm actually taking on pressure. That's not even mine. It's a form hmm. of pride and idolatry to think ministry can only happen when I'm there. Like that's on one hand, like exciting to your pride, but on the other, it's just not, it's just not true. So for me, rest in the context of ministry is, is an act of faith that God is working. He is the one that's moving. It, I don't have to be there for him to move. Shocker. So yeah, it's a, it's an act of faith that he's okay. the one doing the work. So yeah. Mike coming out of living an entrepreneurial life, running your own business and then the church world and then ministry and sport wearing several hats, as you mentioned, this kind of cuts against the grain, doesn't it? To make time to rest. How do you, how's that been important to you? Well, five decades of work life came out of a working family. I appreciate everything you said, sir. I'm probably the worst on the call at resting. Um, I love to work. I was model work. I really didn't understand a concept of rest. In fact, rest uh, from a non-biblical standpoint was lazy in our world. And uh, so it was hard to, to eat. And, and then I brought that into the ministry and really didn't make the transition very well. I would say that I, everything it shit you said was true. Probably a lot of the reason I didn't, uh, if I'm, um, what I've learned, what I, what I learned early on is it felt like I needed to work more because uh, now I had donors that I was accountable to. And so it's a really poor, incorrect way of thinking. And God just had to really correct me. I had gotten remarkably better, but I was not good at this at all. Um, so I appreciate everything you said. And the other thing I would just add to that, Sarah, is just like an athlete, the better rested I am, the better minister I am, and the better I am at home. So just, we're just better when we're rested. Good, good thoughts. Jim, I mean, you've been working and living in high achievement, academic people world, got to be top type A's everywhere that yeah. just burn the candle at both ends. How countercultural is this idea of resting well to where you've been living? Yeah, I mean, it's incredibly countercultural. I mean, to say in, you know, either in Ivy League school or at Stanford here in Silicon Valley or in Manhattan, that that woven into who we are as creatures is the need to along the lines of what Sarah said is to remember that the world doesn't revolve around us that we're not at the center of creation that even though you know there's Kool-Aid that we could drink that would tell us that that is the case and that we play that sort of central role that things would fall apart without us hustling I mean to the degree to which we think our hustle is the thing that keeps things going it seems to me to that same degree is the degree to which we can't help but theologically forget who God is hmm. and what he's about and what he's about in the world. So it seems to me that, you know, some part of this is both, it's both for our good, like physically, but it's so deeply for our good spiritually to just remember the creator creature distinction and say, hmm. hey, who is God? And who am I relative to him as a contingent being? And, and the way Sabbath and rest puts that in front of me and confronts me with that and um, kind of helps me stay in the rhythm of remembering who I am and who he is. And it's challenging in these contexts, but so much more important when there's so much opposition to the idea. Probably the only reason I even bring this idea up among people like us, among our colleagues, is because 10 years ago this spring, I was at an FCA sports chaplain conference in Birmingham. Uh, I'm sorry, not in Birmingham, in Baltimore, Maryland. And a guy named Tom Bronner, who's a psychologist, was standing there doing his presentation, minding his own business. And then he punched me right in the nose when he said, failure to Sabbath is morally equivalent to murder. Mm. Ouch. I sat there in my seat and went, what are you going to do with that? <laughs> and I, I pulled out my phone and 
put a big green bar every Sunday, a recurring event that said Sabbath. Mm. If I don't schedule to rest, I won't. Mm. But from that moment forward, it brought the need to Sabbath right in front of me all the time. Mm. Do I get it done all the time? Probably not. Certainly mm. not. But I'm better at it today than I was 10 years ago. Um, on a one to six scale, I'm going to have you tell on yourselves. On a one to six scale, one being horrible, six being outstanding, how well do you say you Sabbath or rest regularly? Give me a number and tell me why. Jim. Six. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> not, not six. I don't know. I, I think maybe somewhere around a three somewhere around a three or four, I wouldn't say that I'm great at it, but at the same, but at the same, in the same stroke, I, but I don't think I'm horrible at it either. But I wouldn't say that's because I've like, just through sheer willpower figured this thing out. I just think there's some part of Sabbath that seems to me to be, it is physical, but it's also mental and emotional and spiritual too. And I think as I've continued to grow to see the fact that you know, there's this deep sense in which Jesus is our Sabbath rest, you know, yeah. and as our lives are hidden in him, there's a kind of letting go. So I think maybe just, you know, through kind of rough sanctification through the years, I've probably gotten better internally at having a disposition of rest when it needs to happen. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't say, I, but I wouldn't rank myself high, maybe a three, Got it. Um, something like that. Sarah, how does that look from where you sit? I'm glad you talked about the the mental and emotional state. Um, structurally, I would say we we have really changed how we commit to things. We've really changed what we do as far as our lives are concerned around what does Sabbath really look like? So structurally, I'd probably give us a five, but emotionally, like it is still, I call it downshifting. I still have to downshift so frequently. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Even sitting on my porch to being like, you know, I should put some mulch out over there or like really <laughs> that's a mental state of improvement. Yeah. And what we see on Sabbath, the Lord's Sabbath is he called it good. He called what he had good. He was not looking to improve anything. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to get like super legalistic. I'm like, Ooh, I'm thinking yeah. about things that are not Sabbathy, but yeah, I, I would say mental state, maybe a, a four because it's, it's still so effortful to really shut the mental and the emotional side down and be like, no, I'm actively trusting the Lord that he's my enough and what I have is good. So that's what I would yeah. say. I find that on weekends, on vacations, I'm not very good at vacation, but it takes significant time to shut off all the working part of my brain to yeah. create some space just to veg almost. I'm not good at that. Mike, what's your number? One through six. Well, it took, it took me my whole life to get free from this. I was probably not even on your scale uh, for for the first fifty plus years of my life. I would be at I would be a one at best. Mm -hmm. And I think now, uh, and I, I agree with what Jim is. If, if Jesus um, um, Jesus is the Sabbath, and sitting at His feet is the Sabbath. Um, I am, I'm clicking right now. I'm in a good place. I'm probably, probably a high five and I'm not, I don't mean, mean to be arrogant about it. I've just, just took me long to figure it out. And I am grateful for that. I didn't do it on my own. It was the power of the Holy spirit, which we'll talk about later during my sabbatical. Mm -hmm. That's what I've set free. Good. Good. Well, let me ask you each, because we, we kind of all confess that we're not great at this, but what are some factors that keep you and you think others from resting well? What are those factors that keep us from rest? Sarah? I like work. And more than I like work, I like how work makes me feel. Bingo. Yeah. I feel important. I feel valuable. I feel like I'm contributing. I love me some progress. So it's, it's really, it's like the idolatry of sport. Of like, did I really love volleyball? No, I loved how volleyball made me feel. How about that? And I think that's work for me. Like I love producing and that that's an Imago day on me, right? Like he did call us to subdue the earth, you know, like that is part of it, but I almost love that more. Like I love how work makes me feel. And there's a deep discontent. I would say as well, like I'm not made for earth. 
So mm-hmm. like I long for a perfect creation. Like I long for those things and I do want to improve things around me. Like that's, that's also a little bit of God design too. Uh, but to what end, to what extent? So that's what I would say just off the cuff. Yeah. I think this is a trap for a lot of us who are in ministry. Cause honestly, we love what we do. Mm-hmm. And like you say, probably we love the effects of it. Meaning for us, it's not just that we accomplish something or that we no, we see great benefit in the people that we're serving. We see real accomplishment. We see genuine eternal value things. And we're going, this is rich. Let's do more of it. And, but that can easily become a trap that suddenly we're burning the candle at five ends instead of just two. Yep. Jim, your thoughts. I would just agree with everything that she said and the sense too of that we've hinted at previously, which is I, I, there can just be this fundamental lack of trust that things are actually going to get done in the way I think they need to get done unless I'm the one getting it done. And that can show up both in my relationship with God and in my relationships with other people. Like how do I distribute workload to students? So I'm not exactly sure if they're going to get things done exactly the same way. I think there's this tendency in leadership even to say, Hey, if it's going to get done, if it's going to get done right, I might as well just do it. It's simpler for me to just do this thing and know it's going to get done well, even if it causes kind of craziness and I'm not distributing the load to people. Mm. I think at the spiritual level, I, just to only add to what she said, just that sense of, um, I really need to get this done. And there is a sort of mental switch that needs to say, no, th- this is the Lord's work. And I'm happy to have to hold the baton for this leg of it to whatever degree, but it's really his baton and it's really his race. But it's easy for me to hold on too tightly to that and to just exhale and trust him. Yep. It's got to be. I'm thinking a little bit about Mike and he's standing on the threshold of retirement. I'm looking backwards at two years of having left FCA after 27 years. And when I'm riding in the car thinking about stuff and I'm thinking, well, what would happen if I wasn't here or what would happen if I died and I wasn't here? What if I retired and what, you know what? It'd probably continue anyway. The the thing would keep rolling. The ball would not stop spinning. No, we'd keep going. Mike, how are you seeing that in terms of what's that stuff that has kept you from, what are those factors that have kept you from resting well in your previous 50 years of work life? I think it's what Jim and Sarah both articulated well. Number one, I like to work. I grew up working. Uh, I've been working since I was 12 years old, so I didn't know anything else. And I I actually thought in my secular job that I was the only one that could do the job well. Uh, kind of like what Jim said, hired a lot of young people, would get discouraged and just move them aside and say, I'll do it. <laughs> and so uh, a lot of that's very prideful. I think I brought that pride even into the ministry. Mm incorrectly, knowing better uh, uh, theologically, but, but behaving as though Jesus um, um, would actually need me to do the work. Uh, he's, he's chosen me to do the work and he saved me. But the reality is I'm not nearly as important as I probably act like I am. And, and I think the other part I mentioned earlier is just permission to just finding permission. I know the Bible is clear about this. We've given permission, but sometimes don't behave that way. And when we slow down, it's like, can I really slow down? Is that really okay? And just wrestling with the notion that <clears throat> it's okay. We've been given permission by the by God himself, but also the people around us. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Um, let me ask you, what are some of the effects you've noticed of either resting well? What are the effects of that? Or not resting well, resting poorly, what are effects on either side of that continuum that you see, Sarah, among people, even among your, in yourself? I would say my, I'm looking out the window because I'm like, man, I I feel it first at home on both fronts. So when I have rested well, I tend to reap those benefits first in my marriage. Mm -hmm. When I'm not resting well, it's almost like that's the first place I also pay the price. Mm. Um, and it has everything to do with like my attitude, I guess. Um, so yeah, I see that effect and it's probably my internal disposition. Like I am preoccupied. That's a word my husband and I use to describe that sweet state of 
<laughs> I don't really have your attention right now. Like you're preoccupied. <laughs> and he's right. Like I'm thinking about the eight things I didn't do today. And like, anyways, so yeah, that's what I would say. I feel it first in our marriage on both fronts and that's enough. I love Jesus, but I also love my spouse. And that's enough motive for me to be like, this matters. This really, this affects us. So yeah. Hmm. It's Good. Good. Jim, your, your insight here. What are those effects of doing it well or doing it poorly? I love I love what Sarah directed us to there. And and uh, similarly, my wife has joked with me for years that she can tell when I'm in business mode. She's like, oh, you're in mm. business mode right now because she can just see the wheels are turning on all kinds of things. And then when I get out of business mode, how much more present I am. So I'd say that's one thing. I'd say the other thing, uh, Roger, is that, you know, in ministry, there are and in caring for young people, there are always going to be ups and downs, and there are just going to be waves of things that, uh, in times when things are flowing really beautifully, and then there's going to be hard things. And then, what does it look like to be uh, a person of faith? And my my ability to be steady hmm. and resolute and not brought up and down by those things, and to be a safe place for others. To multiply greatly when I've got deep rest myself. It's mm-hmm. the classic thing that people always say: we need to operate out of who we are and not out of what we do. But how mm-hmm. do I really grow who I am and in, in my being? Well, it's by resting and being at the face of Jesus and mm-hmm. and um, yeah, being in that spot. So I think it creates, it makes me better at what I do, it gives me more grace, more patience, more stability. That's good. I've found across my life that when I get tired, when I'm more fatigued, when I'm not resting well, my attitude goes south pretty fast and I become very curt with people. My sarcasm gun comes out and starts firing off really fast <laughs> and people are going, what is wrong with you? Take a nap or something. Just uh, Yeah, you need a nap. That's what we say to our wait. kids, isn't it? Who needs a nap? <laughs> yeah, I don't like that part of me, but it's there. Um Mike, what do you see being the big effects of either sleeping well, resting well, or resting poorly? Uh, well, fatigue for one. Um, but but I, 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 as you guys were talking, I was thinking about I got corrected once by my spiritual mentor. Uh, it's easy to see stress, easier to see stress in other people than yourself, especially if you're a high capacity person. And I had a my mentor one day came in and shut the door and he said, what's wrong with you? I said, I thought I was good until now. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, well, there's something going on because you're edgy. And I think that's, you know, that's, that's a sign you're edgy and the difference between just being edgy and uh, kind of at the, at uh, snappy, maybe a little quick versus just a spirit of calm. And the reality is that's what, that's, that's who we should be when we're in the environments in which we're in, there should be, there should be peace. There should be joy. There should be a calmness to how we even even the stresses of life, the things I told you I'm going through with my family right now. It's like um, if 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 we are not rested, then we're not we're not ready. And, and I just I just whether you, I don't know if you all agree with it, but I think other people see it in us before we see it in ourselves. Mm-hmm. Probably so. Agreed. Hey, let's turn the table a little bit here and let's talk about sabbatical. We've been talking about sabbath that's like short-term rest let's talk about sabbatical which is intended to be extended rest for a particular purpose Uh, fellowship of christian athletes instituted this a couple of three years ago uh, that staff could take one on a certain frequency and after a certain number of years and that rolled up to me in the fall of 2020 and i thought let's do this thing let's see but i had to have a plan for it and i found it to be fantastic Mike, I know you did one with a tremendous effect. Uh, at least that's why you told it to me. How did you plan for your sabbatical when you did it? What What was your game plan? Well, first of all, I had to know it was okay because my view of sabbaticals is this, my incorrect view. The sabbatical was just a vacation for pastors, uh, uh, <laughs> pastors to go to not count as vacation this is what i thought <laughs> i would never consider going on a sabbatical and, and and roger the only reason i really went on it i think other than the lord moving in my heart was i heard from you 
Huh. And if you remember, we had a conversation you had talked about, and I'm like, well, if Roger Light can do it, then maybe I can go on a sabbatical. So I applied for it and uh, and went on it. And the best thing I probably did was talk to yourself and other people that had been on sabbatical, some that had done it well, some that had done it poorly, and tried to develop a game plan rather than it was 30 days. But how am I going to best utilize the 30 days to meet the goals and ideas that I have uh, in store for me? Which So I really kind of set out with, with an idea as to what that would look like. And you helped me a lot with that, Roger. Hmm. What did you plan to do during it? What were the activities? What were the things you did to make it significant? Uh, well, <laughs> the first thing I did... Um, I divide, I, I really, t I knew I was going to have a month. So I thought, okay, can I divide this into <clears throat> each individual week? Could I have a goal within each week? Hmm. The first week, um, I love to be outdoors and I loved exercise and knew I needed something like that to get started. So I actually, without planning, got in my car, got my bike, drove to St. Louis, got on a train, took my bike out to the other side of the state, rode my bike all the way across the state. Wow. Uh, that was my first week. And it was there that I met Jesus <laughs> huh. and heard from him clearly. And I took with me a Bible and a book that really a guy that had, he said, if you're going on a sabbatical, take this book and read it. And I was all in on it. And so that was my first week. My second week, I actually uh, was more spiritual and just and just uh, spending time with the Lord. And I did that. A friend of mine had a cabin by a river, and I just and I just soaked that up. The third week was more family oriented, and then my fourth week was really after I had experienced those things. Was how do I plan the next season of my life from a, uh, in every area of my life, but in particular in my role as FCA? What's a win and what are my steps? So I kind of I thought I did pretty well with that, but kept enough. Um, uh, room and obviously open for the Holy Spirit to do his work. Long answer. Sorry. No, that's good. That's exactly what I wanted. I mean, it, in things like this, especially if there's foreign as 30 days with no apparent responsibility, to scare the crap out of people like us. We're wondering what in the world would I do with all that time? It helps to have a game plan. That was good. What were the effects? Bottom line, what happened because of it? Well, I'm sitting here today. Mm. Uh, I was going to retire two years ago mm. and weirdly taking a sabbatical sabbatical because I was just tired. I felt like I had um, uh, done what I had been called to do. I didn't think I was done with ministry, but I was just tired. Huh. And had I not taken the sabbatical mm. and been refreshed and heard clearly from the Lord that I, that my time, my time, my time was all off. It is, he had another plan. The last year and a half has been the best year and a half I've had, not both personally and spiritually. And I'd have missed it all. Wow. I would have missed it all had I not just stopped. And I told my wife the first day when I stopped on my bike that day, I said, it's the first time in my life I haven't been in a hurry to go anywhere. I didn't even have a plan. And I just thought about that. I'm like, I've, I've lived a life of hurry and I just needed to slow down. Hmm. J.I. Yeah, Packer has a great quote in, in Knowing God. He says, live slowly enough to think deeply about God. Huh. And I was just, I was not living slowly enough. Huh. And so I'm here today still, and the ministry is being ready to be transitioned into some beautiful people that are preparing and are going to do a great job because of my Sabbath. Good. Remember I, reading. Excuse me. <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. I remember reading a book by John Stott a number of years ago where he talked about building mini sabbaticals into one's schedule, whether it's a day, it's half a day, it's an hour, it's whatever. Build some space where you can stop, think, listen, not be in a hurry. And so it's been a, I've been doing that for years, like pick one day a month and slow down, listen. Don't be in a hurry to talk. Just listen a lot. Um, Jim, Sarah, do you have reflections or uh, insights from Mike's experience with his sabbatical that you'd want to share? I haven't taken a, a sabbatical uh, on purpose, um, but I did have a functional one. When we moved from New York, 
and started out here, um, started anew here at Stanford for that first six months or so. It took me a while to kind of get to know students and break in mm -hmm. and build the relationship. And it was, and so I realized at first that was frustrating. This sort of enforced Sabbath was frustrating to me because mm -hmm. I wanted to be busy and productive and have return on investment of my work and what I wanted to see. And yet the Lord just created space for me to not do it, you know, like not like I had to slow down and how beneficial that was. So I love the idea too, um, of having a structured plan to what you're doing, which again is sort of like, okay, is that having an agenda for what we're going to get done in Sabbath and accomplish in sabbatical, you know, it's like, okay. For me. And, and yet at the same <laughs> right, like, like, but to really redeem that time, the days are evil. So I was actually going to ask Mike, Mike, what, what was that book that you brought with you that the guy recommended for your uh, first week? Gentle and Lowly. Hmm. And, it's, and it's and it's a book um, that's written um, four verses, Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 through, um, no, 20, yeah, 28 through 32, I guess, um, for Jesus gentle and lonely and hard. It's the only place, uh, Spurgeon says, the only place in the entire scriptures where Jesus lets you into his heart. Hmm. And this is who I am. Here's the heart of Jesus. Hmm. And then, and then of course that, 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 that passage also talks about having rest for your soul. Hmm. And so it was a perfect book for me, well-written, just some beautiful insight that I got from that book. It's written by a guy named Dane Ortland, and it Ortland. has around southeast missouri like wildfires it's it's really a good read good sarah did you have thoughts related to this medical i thought it was interesting that you encountered him doing something you love um and he made you to love that like that's part of how he made you and i think sometimes we we think sabbatical has to be or even sabbath has to be this laborious lock myself in a closet with one light on and a bookshelf and pray until the wallpaper falls off. But in reality, he met, he met you on a bike ride. And I'm imagining for some of us, like that's a fishing trip or a sunset on a beach. I just think our perspective of Sabbath, like he, he meets us doing what we love and it reminds us of the God we love. I just think that's really cool that it, it was a bike ride. That's good. Let me ask you, Mike, if you were, if you had the opportunity to do another one, what would, might you do differently? I'll ask Jim and Sarah also about if you were going to do one, do you have a plan? What would, what might you do? Mike, what would you do differently if you had another one to do? Um, I like the way it went. Um, I don't have a great answer for that, but I think one thing I would do is if I would find some time, I, I did get some family time, but I, I would probably find some time to invite a trusted friend into the conversation and, and help me process some of the things I was learning. All the processing I did, I did alone and with mm. the, nothing wrong with that, but I think if I would have had an opportunity to experience some of that with um with with somebody else with somebody i really trust i think it would be even more helpful yeah uh in mine i took some time and uh selected a number of long-term friends and just sat and talked with them for a couple of three hours each just to say where are we and where does it appear we're going and just to get their thoughts about where life is, what's happening, where are we going? And it was rich just to not be in a hurry and sit there and talk with them and tell a few stories about the past, but also here's where we are. I think this is what's coming up. How do we prepare for that? That was really helpful to me. So I like your idea of drawing others in to be part of the process. Mm -hmm. uh, Jim or Sarah, if, if you've dreamt about this, what might be a part of your sabbatical? Sarah, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah sure. I've had two thoughts about this. Uh, I was actually planning to do it uh, in 2020. So I had a forced sabbatical like most of us did in yeah. 2020. What I couldn't do then um, is what would have made it sabbatical for me, which would have been revisiting some roots. Mm -hmm. So I would love to go back to the gym where I was when I heard the gospel clear for the first yeah. time. Like I would just love to go sit in those bleachers at Hunter Middle School. 
that'd be one. Um, and then key relationships and places. Roger, I don't know why I remember this. You posted a status like six months ago and you were like, if I just had an infinite budget to visit all the people, like if I could have a, just a window of that um, in Tennessee and, and in Colorado specifically where I first launched into ministry, hmm. I mean, just to sit in the H hall at USAFA and be like, yeah, like my first huddle experience was here and to reconnect with that girl who said yes to Jesus all those years to go in ministry that, and then friends, like I would love a week of just unbridled fun with friends. I think that would <laughs> be really sweet. So that's fun. Years ago, the first time I went back to black mountain YMCA place at, uh, the Blue Ridge Assembly, where I'd gone to FCA camp as a high school kid. And then wow. here I am as an FCA staffer all these years later. I just went back and sat about in the same area where I had when I was a high school kid and just hearing some folks from across the years in my head going, I saw that guy talk right there and he's dead. And this guy and he's dead. And this one and he's dead. And I'm still here. What does this mean? Just to be able to sit and visit those places. It's kind of like Abraham. He would go back to Bethel all the time. Yeah. Uh, Jim, your thoughts. I don't think I have much to add other than the only the only piece I would add is just being able to do that in conjunction, all of this in conjunction with my wife in ways too. But just having good opportunity to be with her and to process. It feels like, I don't know if you all feel this way, but the pace of life can be so fast that you would think that it'd be easy to have conversations about important things with the person that you sleep next to every night. And yet it seems like it's easy for that to not happen. So to be able to invest these pieces into that as well would be big. That's good. That's good. All right. Kind of a summary thought here. A question I have for you is given all that we've talked about, the, the pros and the cons of doing it well versus doing it poorly and all the stuff we've discussed, Sabbath and sabbatical, how does one build Sabbath into his or her life? What are, how are ways we can make sure we do this? How do we schedule for it? How do you build it in in a healthy way? Uh, Sarah, why don't you jump in first? Sure. Uh, for my husband and I, we've agreed at a minimum, one day every two weeks is like a non-negotiable Sabbath. Um, and, yeah. and I use that term loosely because it's people define that a number of ways. I think there's a richer, more biblical meaning than we even would embrace. Sure. But we would define that as there's a short list of things that are life-giving to us, mm -hmm. want to happen on that day. And there's a short list of things we will not do on that day. So every two weeks or so, it's like, okay, is it Saturday or Sunday? which week is it? Okay. Well, we got to cut the grass on Saturday. So therefore we're, <laughs> you know, whatever it may be, we've got this birthday party here. So therefore it'll be Sunday. Um, that, that minimum has been so helpful and it forces us to say no to things, uh, which is good. This is really good. So that would be one really specific example for us. The other is that list itself. If you start out being like, well, what we do all day, uh, you'll just find yourself doing what you normally do. But if you plan and say, okay, we're going to go to church. We're going to come home. We're going to make sandwiches and we're going to take them to the lake and sit on our chairs and get a sunburn. Like that is the goal of the day. Get a sunburn. Like you'll actually find yourself doing those things left to your own. It may or may not be Good. his. Good. Mm -hmm. Jim, your thoughts. I'd say uh, two things. Uh, so the, you know, obviously it's a given to find, you know, that time weekly, but two things, one dovetails really well into what Sarah said, which is, I, I think it's fine to find things that you love and that you love doing with your spouse and that, that feed your soul in those ways. We did a thing a few years ago where, um, and it's been a while since we've done it, but we decided that we were going to cook a meal together that we really like together one day, one day a week. So we would find, you know, like sometimes with restaurants that you like, you can hack and find the recipes yeah. for certain dishes so we like found some internet version of a macaroni grill dill you know dish that we really loved and we right. just said hey like, once a week we're going to do this so I, you know finding things that you really love and enjoying that with other people like bike riding or sitting in the lake whatever that might be and then the other thing too is um i was actually 
I'm reading through mere Christianity with a group of students, you know, it's such a classic. And yeah. um, I just happen to have this in front of me right now. I'm just going to read it real quick. This is Lewis talking about faith. And th so what does it look like to do this sort of on a daily basis? I just love his language for this. He says, the first step is to recognize the fact that your moods change. The next is to make sure that if you have once accepted Christianity, then some of its main doctrine shall be directly held before your mind for some time every day. That's why daily prayer and religious readings and church goings are necessary parts of the Christian life. We have to be continually reminded of what we believe. Neither this belief nor any other will automatically remain alive in the mind. It must be fed. I love that idea from Lewis of saying, I'm going to take deep truths of my faith, and hold them in front of my mind for some time every day. That's a different way of thinking about the classic sort of Christian devotional life or quiet time or whatever. But that sort of thing brings a bit of Sabbath into my daily experience when I do that and I reflect on who God is. That's good. I just read a book by Eugene Peterson where he was talking about a gentleman in his congregation who is a self-avowed uh, atheist. And he watched him as he was attending church ostensibly for his daughter and they're coming in and week to week they're saying the apostles creed and at first he's standing there with his arms folded and you know like month six he's he's repeating the first two lines with everybody and then next week he's repeating the next line and he said in a period of about 18 months all of a sudden he's saying the whole apostles creed and he has come to believe because mm -hmm. he was reminded week by week by week this is what we believe just like mm -hmm. Lewis said there. Brilliant. Uh, Mike, your thoughts about how does one build rest Sabbath into his or her life? Well, I have a couple of thoughts. Um, one is reading. I mean, I, I, I don't know how we get better in life without spending time both in the word and, and learning from other people. And, it, and what it does, I love to read. I didn't always love to read, but it, that it causes me, it, it it is rest for my soul. I just love learning, and I and what I what I did for years was I wasn't very diverse in my reading, and so I've grown in that area. That's been really helpful. But one thing that Sarah and Jimbo said, uh, I can remember reading Wild at Heart about fifteen years ago, and on page two hundred, I'll never forget this. It's etched in my mind. The author said, "What makes you come alive?" And I didn't have a good answer because all I knew was work. And so piggybacking off of what Jim and Sarah both said, for us and our family, it's what makes us come alive as a couple. And so uh, for us, weirdly, I don't think it's weird. We had to find something because I like doing certain things. She likes doing certain things. What are we going to do together? How are we going to come alive together and the next season of our marriage be even better? And we found pickleball community. I mean, it sounds weird, but it works. I mean, she lives, breathes, pickleball. We do it together. We compete together. We compete against each other. It's healthy, and it's just something we enjoy together. And we did not have that. Hmm. And so I think it's not just finding something that makes me come alive, but as a family, what makes us come alive. Excellent. Great. Any summary thoughts, y'all? Otherwise, I'm just going to challenge real hard. All right, here it comes. If you don't schedule for rest, it won't happen. That's why in my perpetual calendar up here on my wall, the big, most important things that I want to make sure I get done, they go on the calendar first. That family vacation in July is on there. Nothing is going to touch that. And it's in smaller increments that way also. If I put that big green bar all the way through Sunday, that prompts me to Sabbath, I'm more likely to do it than not. It's the same way. If I miss that because I'm traveling or I miss that because I'm serving with a team or something's happening on Sunday, I'm going to find a way to steal a half a day from work and put it in there. Just so, like you guys have said, so my soul can rest. Memorizing scriptures like Psalm 131 is helpful. Some of those things that encourage rest for your soul. Those things are important. Find ways to build that stuff into your life. Um, Sarah, may I ask you to pray to wrap things up for us today? I'd be honored. Thanks, Roger. Mm. 
Well, Lord, even now, um, I'm just thankful that for us, you, you have done the work of salvation so we can rest Lord. And that we just put our faith and our trust in you that we are solely dependent on you and the sufficiency of your work. Lord, I pray our whole lives would preach that gospel that we're not sufficient. We can't, you can, and our hope and our trust is in you. Um, so Lord, as we talk about things like rest and Sabbath, Lord, I pray we'd be just deeply reminded and rooted in the gospel that this is the truth of our salvation, um, that we've rested from our work because you've completed yours and uh, we believe in you for that. So uh, I pray that you would just continue to lead us to know you better in this area, that we would trust you um, more deeply, whether it's with our time or our mental state or our commitments, Lord, um, that you would conform us into your own image. And Jesus, you yourself rested and uh, we've got no greater permission than what you modeled for us. So thank you for this time. I thank you for Roger's ministry. And I pray that um, you would lead us into deeper areas of rest in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, everyone.